Hey everybody, Nicholas Board here, and welcome to my YouTube channel. As always, thank you for stopping by. It means the world to me that you're willing to take time out of your busy day to enjoy the content that I'm uh, producing here. I hope that you find it both enjoyable and educational, and I certainly hope that's the case with this video as well. Uh, today, I'm going to be discussing uh, the stocks that are at the top of my personal watch list. Uh, as many of you know who follow me regularly, or if you're a subscriber to Dividend Kings or the Intelligent Dividend Investor, the, you know the services, the people that I interact with on a regular basis. You know, every month I uh, I have savings, and then I obviously try to put that to work. Uh, I do my best to sort of ignore the macro, uh, either headwinds or tailwinds. You know, the the general sentiment surrounding the the broader market, and instead focus on fundamentals always looking to uh, accumulate shares of the best companies in the world, generally dividend growth companies, um, you know, every month by putting cash to work regularly, not only am I adding to my share count, but I'm also augmenting my passive income stream. So uh, I haven't really put a lot of cash work uh, to work thus far through the month of April. I have, I think, roughly 70% of the funds that I've allocated towards the market this month, uh, you know, sitting as dry powder. So uh, in the next week or so, I have some work to do. And I uh, obviously wanted to highlight uh, sort of my mindset with you all. Uh, before I get into the list, I do have some uh, some normal sort of shopkeeping to say. First and foremost, I need to give my normal disclosure, uh, clearly stating that I am not a financial advisor in any way, shape or form. And therefore, all of the information discussed uh, in this video and on this YouTube channel uh, overall, none of it should be taken as financial advice. Uh, please go see a professional if you need help with the markets, if you have questions about your portfolio or about financial planning, financial literacy, uh, you know, retirement planning, all of those things. That's what they're there for. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, as a, you know, uh, just be you know, basically, you just don't need to be taking advice from a stranger on YouTube. Uh, you know, I say that sort of putting myself down. However, that is, uh, you know, just the right sort of path to tread when it comes to your own journey towards financial freedom. The trades that I'm making and that I'm discussing in these videos and in the articles that I write, etc., those are trades that I believe are best for me, but what's best for me may not be best for you. Uh, so with that out of the way, I also want to attempt to pay some bills here and say, if you haven't already, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, not only can you subscribe, but you can also hit the bell to get notifications. Uh, you know, when I produce more content, my target is, uh, you know, two to four videos a week these days. That's kind of what makes most sense within my schedule. Um, and then also please like the videos and obviously leave a comment below, uh, a question, uh, you know, anything really, I'm always happy to discuss things with viewers doing those things, leaving comments, liking the videos, subscribing to the channel, etc. Those things do move up, uh, you know, the videos in the YouTube algorithm and help the channel to grow. The, the bigger the channel gets, the more time and energy I uh, can allocate towards it. So more videos for you guys. So uh, that would be most appreciated. Also, if you haven't already, please sign up for Durable Dividends. That is the page shown on the screen here. I will leave a link in the description below. This is a sort of high level dividend growth oriented uh you know weekly newsletter totally free all you have to do is put your email address in and you'll receive content from me on a weekly basis um and then before i get started in the video i do need to quickly say uh two things one uh i'm sorry i know a lot of you guys follow me normally or regularly and through various different uh you know media outlets and um you know i haven't been very active this week i'm sorry about that i was traveling I dropped my laptop and it broke. The Apple store down in Birmingham, Alabama uh, was very nice, wonderful people down there. However, they weren't able to fix my problem with just a drop-in appointment. So I was sort of computerless uh, all week. I certainly wasn't planning for that to be the case. So I haven't produced uh, a lot of content, done a lot of work, <coughs> excuse me, work this week. Um, I'm trying to get caught up back up now. That's what this video is about. That's what a lot of the work that I've done over the weekend is about. So I've been behind, uh, you know, thank you, thank you so much for putting up with that, and I'm very sorry. Secondly, that cough brings me to the second thing I wanted to say. I am I am under the weather. I've had allergy, uh, post-nasal drip, coughs type stuff for about a week now, so please forgive me uh, if I do cough, sneeze, etc. during this video. 
uh, or if just my voice doesn't sound normal. I don't think that it does. I'm certainly, uh, you know, trying to get past this. I drank a hot uh, cup of herbal tea before I started. So we'll see if that gets me through the video. Uh, and then lastly, I, I just made a little note for myself uh, to, to mention this. You know, I have made a lot of videos recently on stocks that I've bought or stocks that I'm thinking about buying. Um, so, you know, this video won't cover Qualcomm, Adobe, Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, Stanley Black & Decker, Salesforce, Netflix, which I most recently bought at 217, or uh, Al Rock Capital. Uh, these are all companies that I could buy in the next week or so, depending on what happens in the market. They're all near the top of my watch list. However, I have, uh, you know, highlighted them all in recent YouTube videos, so I don't want to be redundant. So with that being said, uh, today I'm going to highlight stocks that are either at the very top of my list, my highest conviction picks, and or names that I haven't covered recently uh, on this channel that people may want to add to their own sort of due diligence to-do list. Uh, I did make a video last week highlighting the fact that I do like all four of the FANG names right now, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Uh, however, I, I, I want to kind of just re-highlight Alphabet. This stock has struggled uh, during the last week or so. Actually, let's go over here. I pulled this up ahead of time. I was looking at Microsoft before I started. Let's go to Amazon uh, Alphabet. Excuse me. We see stocks down 6% during the last week and 15.6.5.6% etc. during the last month. Uh, pretty significant weakness for this company. As you can see here on the fast graph, it doesn't get much more consistent on the bottom line than Alphabet has been over the last couple decades. Uh, you know, people love to hate big tech. People uh, will have opinions about Google in particular, uh, about the Android operating system, which Google owns, about YouTube, which Google owns, etc. This is a uh, huge player in the uh, search, in the media, in the big data, uh, cybersecurity, cloud. There's a lot going on at Google here. Uh, they have a lot of, you know, for the lack of a better term, haters. However, as if you're someone like me, uh, I don't really pay so much attention to those storylines or those narratives. Instead, I pay attention to the fundamentals in uh, Alphabet here has been growing them at a very uh, reliably uh, fantastic rate over the last several decades that accelerated last year and they're during their fiscal 2021. As you can see, uh, up 91% on the bottom line. It's expected to slow a bit this year, which is to be expected. You obviously can't grow at this pace overall. And frankly, uh, the fact that uh, Alphabet was able to nearly double its EPS last year and then is still going to post positive growth this year, that's wonderful. Moving forward to 2023 and 2024, you can see analysts are expecting uh, the sort of normal 15 to 20% growth during those years. So uh, with that in mind, we do see the stock is currently trading for 21.1 times blended PE. Uh, I went ahead and put the custom line on the fast graph here at 21.1 times. And you can see that is essentially the COVID bottom of March 2020. We also see, <coughs> excuse me, that Alphavet uh, has bounced off of this level several times over the past five or 10 years. This has been a pretty reliable bottom uh, for the stock dating all the way back to like 20, 2013, 2014, uh, you know, just follow the black line versus the pink line on the chart on the screen here. Obviously this could break down. There's no telling that what happens in the past could happen in the future, but when it comes to blue chip companies that are still growing at a very, uh, you know, reliable rate that have strong fundamentals, this is an AA plus rated balance sheet. Um, I think I discussed this in the uh, thing video. So go check that out. But their balance sheet is amazing. I think they have something like 120 billion in cash on the books. Uh, huge net cash position. Uh, they've been buying back shares. Their cash flows are growing. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, unfortunately, I think that will be a trend throughout this video. Like I said, I apologize about the coughs ahead of time. And, uh, you know, hopefully in a week or two, those won't be an issue anymore. But anyway, uh, I just I love it when we look at, at charts like this. You can see the blue line is the long term chart. Uh, Alphabet is not only below that, but they are up against the pink line, which represents long term support. Heading to the forecasting tool here, we can see even if we don't see uh, multiple expansion, which I think is likely and, and, and probably to be called for, I think a stock 
growing at 17 or 15 percent shouldn't trade at 21 times that's a little light for me but even if we don't see that by the end looking out over the next uh you know uh what eight months or so uh, only two percent returns that's because this isn't expected to be a very strong year this year but looking out towards by the end of 2023 uh alphabet from this level will compound at roughly 11 percent per year and that accelerates up to 12 percent uh by the end of 2024 as I've said many times here, any opportunity I have where I think that I can reliably and with relatively low risk compound my capital at a double digit rate, always pleased to do so. And although Alphabet doesn't pay a dividend, it's not the typical stock I'm talking about on this channel. Uh, you know, it is such a high quality name with such reliable growth and a relatively cheap valuation that I think the risk reward here is quite attractive. So if you're someone looking to add some tech, if you're someone looking to add some growth to your portfolio, uh, you know, I would suggest doing some research and getting acquainted uh, with this company. And certainly don't be surprised if you see me adding to my already overweight position. Uh, a more volatile stock and certainly a, I think a more speculative stock with regard to the valuation is NVIDIA. This is a semiconductor name, so it has proven to be uh, more cyclical than Alphabet. You do see some red here on the bottom line. Um I love NVIDIA. I've owned it for a long time. They're one of my best performing positions. Uh, at the peak here, you can see they were, you know, they've fallen quite a bit. At the end of last year, they were up at, you know, 315, 320. Now they're all the way down at 195. This was a 10 bagger for me up here at the top. I bought a long time ago, I think, uh, even prior to that, I think, you know, 2015, 2016. This was uh, one of my first NVIDIA purchases. It was, um, the stock is split, so it's hard for me to know exactly what my split adjusted basis is off the top of my head. I think I was buying at like $110 uh, years ago. Uh, anyway, it's been a huge success. I'm very happy to hold it. They have leadership positions in the gaming space and in the data center space. They have, you know, they had some crypto. I think they're trying to get away from that. Um, but a lot of these secular plays in this, in the technology area overall and in the semiconductor space, NVIDIA has exposure to, and not only do they have exposure to, but they are proven leaders. Um, so I, I love having exposure to the stock. You see the fantastic growth they had last year. They're expected to grow by 78%. Oh, excuse me. That was fiscal 2022. They're into fiscal 2023 now. 73% and 78% the last two years. 27% uh, this year. So once again, they've they've basically already you know doubled, more than doubled their EPS um, during the last couple of years. And then they're still growing at a very reliable rate. That's amazing to me. That shows the very strong tailwinds this company benefits from. They're trading at 41 and a half times, so obviously a very high valuation. Um, when you're growing at 70% per year, that's very cheap. When you're growing at you know 17 to 15%, that's still pretty expensive, right? So it's hard to evaluate NVIDIA. However, uh, I did want to pull up the fact that their current valuation um, is lower than their 2021 trough, so there's something to be said for that. It's not quite down to the COVID-19 bottom. However, if you go back to 2017, 2018, 2019, you will see that this kind of 41 and a half times level served as pretty strong support. So uh, it's not a perfect trend line. It's not doesn't nearly line up as well as the alphabet one did. But uh, I think there's something to be said for support levels like this. If we can get rid of the long term chart, it becomes kind of more clear here. Look over the last five or 10 years. Uh, you know, I, I think that I wouldn't be surprised to see the stock bounce from here. It certainly could go lower. As we've seen, it was trading for 20 times uh, just a couple of years ago. Uh, anybody that bought NVIDIA during this dip is feeling great about themselves today. And I do think that this significant sell off is another, uh, you know, potentially nice opportunity to get exposure to this stock. Names like NVIDIA that go on huge runs, oftentimes people, they don't like to buy them in the weakness, but then they regret it once the runs occur. So, uh, you know, I tried to avoid things like that to myself by always adding into weakness. We see during the last six months, these shares are down 15.7%. During the last year, they're still up. I think it's like the last three months would be pretty bad. The last month, they're down 29.5%. And, and then year to date, uh, yeah, 35%. So uh, buying a blue chip growth stock like NVIDIA down 35% from the highs is always intriguing to me. Uh, they do pay a teeny dividend. I think they yielded like a 1% when I first bought them. They're not growing the dividend anymore, so I don't consider this to be a dividend growth stock. This is all about the growth. 
Uh, you know, but I do think it's pretty interesting here. I do want to point out this. I think kind of the long-term average here, we see the uh, kind of the uh, 10 year average at roughly 35 times. That's essentially where we are when we're looking at, excuse me, next year's, uh, this fiscal year's on a forward basis, 195, roughly 195 here. So, uh, you know, if you're willing to look 12, uh, you know, what, now only eight months down the road, assuming that the company does grow at 27% like it's supposed to, like these analysts are calling for, and this isn't just one opinion, right? This is the consensus aggregate opinion of 40 different uh, professional analysts. So, uh, you know, I think that is likely to be close to the final result, uh, barring something totally unexpected. But anyway, assuming this occurs, you know, roughly 25% growth this year, then you're trading for roughly 35, 34 and a half times forward earnings. That is the sort of, you know, 10 year average. And, uh, you know, anytime I'm able to uh, buy a blue chip, like NVIDIA, when it's trading near fair value, I think you're probably going to do well for yourself there. I certainly think I'm going to do well for myself. So, um, I may not buy this just because of the lack of the, of the dividend and because there could be further weakness as we have seen in the past. But, uh, you know, I, I know there's a lot of people that during these huge runs, they say, man, I wish I owned NVIDIA. You know, I, I missed the dip. I regret it. Yada, yada, yada. Well, here's the 35% sell off. Um, I'm certainly thinking about adding to my position and I imagine others, uh, are as well along the same lines. Uh, Microsoft isn't nearly as cheap, but it is arguably the highest quality company on earth. It's one of two companies with a AAA rated balance sheet. The other one is Johnson and Johnson. So, uh, this, you know, just for reference, the, uh, United States government is AA plus, right? The same as alphabet. So, um, Microsoft has technically a better balance sheet than the U.S. government. Uh, that is just uh, simply amazing to me. We do see the stock has trended upward and upward and upward with regard to their valuation premium um, throughout uh, the recent years, and namely throughout their current CEO, Satya Nadella's tenure. He has done a fantastic job. He sort of transitioned away from old tech and hardware into the cloud with software, software as a service, uh, Microsoft is exactly where they want to be or where really any company would want to be with regard to their software exposure, their subscription revenue exposure, exposure. They just made a huge, uh, acquisition in the gaming space, which, uh, also benefits from secular tailwinds. So there's a lot to like about Microsoft, a uh, 30 times blended premium. Isn't necessarily all that attractive. Uh, you know, over the long term, you can say over the last 10 years, 20 and a half times as the average PDE. If we go look at the last five years, we do see that's risen up to 27 times. So we're coming, you know, close to that last five year premium here. And once again, the reason I'm pointing this out is because on a forward basis, we're actually below that, right? We're at 27, 27 times, uh, you know, fiscal 23's earnings would be 291 right now. So that is below where we're at here at 275. If we go back and uh, look at this 25 times line, this is a custom valuation uh, I think 20 times, uh, 25 times forward makes a lot of sense for Microsoft. It's growing at 15 to 17%. So, you know, it's roughly a 1.5, 1.7 times peg. Uh, because of the very high balance sheet, the, the wonderful revenue growth, the wonderful earnings growth, and the wonderful uh, shareholder returns, the dividend yield is quite low, but that's because of the massive shareholder uh, capital gains. This company grows its dividend, you know, 8 to 12% every single year. And uh, obviously, I can't sit here and make guarantees over the long term, but you do see the payout ratio is quite low. Earnings are turning higher at a double digit rate. I think the dividend will continue to compound at a double digit rate as well. So anyway, with all that in mind, I think 20 times, 25 times forward, I don't know why I'm struggling to say that, uh, but I am, is fair value for Microsoft. And looking on the chart here, we see, you know, a roughly 268 and 50 cent price target uh, for me anyway. And that's, we're almost there, right? So anytime, like I said, I have a chance to buy a blue chip, a besting breed, a just absolutely wonderful company like Microsoft at fair value, that is all that I want to see. You do see the company also bounced uh, off that 25 times threshold during the COVID bottom. Uh, that gives me a lot of faith that there is limited downside. I'm happy to be patient and wait a year. I think 15% growth over the next, uh, you know, <coughs> excuse me, you know, 14 months is likely. 
Uh, so even if my returns over the next 14 months or so aren't great, starting from there, uh, they should start to accelerate to the upside. And instead of getting cute and waiting for a, the sell-off to progress all the way down here to 233, which would represent a very significant drop from their roughly $350 peak, um, you know, I'm happy to kind of buy here at that 270 level and just let my shares compound. I'll patiently, uh, you know, hold and collect the dividend. That's the strategy that I've been, <coughs> excuse me, uh, willing to have over the years. And it's worked out well for me, uh, you know, something to consider for yourself as well. So this kind of leaves the, the big tech area of the market. As you guys know, I'm overweight tech. I love tech. I think it has secular tailwinds. Uh, I love it. They're, they're the higher margins, the, the reoccurring revenue streams, and the strong shareholder returns. But there's obviously other places uh, in the market that investors can do well at as well. I've highlighted Cummins so many times over the last six months or so. Uh, you know, I think this company grew at 20% last year coming off of the COVID, uh, you know, disruption. It expected to grow at 18% this year and 16% next year. Yes, as you can see here, looking out to 2024, analysts are expecting essentially flat growth. <coughs> uh, in other words, sort of the cyclical bottom. You can see it's pretty consistent. You know, every two to three years, uh, there's a down year, and then you get some two to three years of positive growth. That's how a cyclical company like Cummins operates. And, uh, you know, we I do think we're still kind of early in, uh, in the, the early to mid innings of the current uptrend. Obviously, that could be wrong. I don't. I can't look into the future, but that's what analysts are expecting as well. Uh, once again, if we go look at the forecasting here, we can see there's 21 individuals on Wall Street that uh, agree with me. And with that in mind, with this level of growth, uh, you know, I think a 15 to 17 times multiple in the stock makes sense. You can see the long-term average is 15.3 times. Uh, once again, kind of in line with my target. I've just been using the lower end of my fair value estimate there when. Uh, applying a price target to shares, but 15 times uh, this year's earning estimates is 260 bucks. Well, today the stock's trading for 199.20. 15 times the 2023 estimate is 302 dollars. So if we could just go look at this, if the stock trades at 15 times, you're compounding uh, your money at a, over a 30% clip over the next two years buying Cummins here. Uh, this company's not overly exciting. I've done uh, focus ticker videos, look back through my archives. Over the last three to four months, I've, I've highlighted Cummins several times. I talk about this company in depth, but just purely from a fundamental perspective, uh, this sell-off to me seems irrational. The, the stock has sold off from that kind of 260 level all the way down here to 200 during a period of time where we've seen earnings go up by 20%. So like I've said many times, anytime the share price is heading in a different direction than the earnings trajectory, there's a dislocation, there's a disconnection between the market and the stock generally that has to do with either fear or greed depending on uh, you know which way the share price is headed relative to the earnings growth right now we see the sell-off representing fear i'm always happy to kind of go against that grain as long as the fundamentals are improving in cummins case they are buying the stock here at 12 times earnings on a blended basis seems super cheap to me and we'll pull up the calculator here at 199.20 the stock is trading for just 11 and a half times expected 2022 earnings. Give me a blue chip like Cummins at 11 and a half times forward any day of the week. I'd be happy. The stock yields 2.91%. I've been buying this stock all throughout this weakness and it remains at the top of my watch list. So certainly don't be surprised if you hear that I add to my Cummins position uh, again in the near future. Uh, this is a company that I've actually never owned before, but I would have loved to. <coughs> Uh, excuse me, Sharon Williams is a paint company. Once again, kind of another boring stock. Paint is certainly not exciting. However, looking at the long-term chart here, what is exciting is this fantastic earnings growth that uh, Sher Sherwin Williams has generated over the years. We do see during recessionary periods, they do tend to struggle. Uh, they are kind of require, they are a little bit economically sensitive. Uh, they do require a strong consumer and also a strong housing market. Those two things help the stock. Uh, also, rising oil prices actually hurt the stock because a lot of their product is petroleum-based, oil-based paint. Um, however, we can see a pretty significant sell-off over uh, throughout 2022. 
to go ahead and just pull it up here. We'll see what their year to date performance is. I'm sure it's pretty abysmal. Uh, this stock is down nearly 28% on a year to date basis. Uh, so like I said, this is a company that's been on my watch list literally for years. I've always thought they're kind of too expensive, uh, you know, trading for 25 to 30 times earnings. However, I've come just to regret that too many times. I've been waiting for an opportunity uh, to buy Sherwin-Williams near fair value. We do see the long-term uh, price to earnings ratio here is 20.4 times. I don't see the stock heading that low anytime soon. During the last 10 years, however, it's 25.4 times. So on a forward basis, the company is expected to grow earnings 15% this year. We see 25.4 times the current consensus 2022 earnings estimate is $237.50. We'll go ahead and round up there. Today, the stock trades at $244.92, so roughly $245. Uh, you know, we need to drop like what, eight bucks? Eight bucks a share here. That's certainly possible. The stock was down, uh, you know, nearly $7 a share uh, on Friday of last week. So, with that in mind, uh, Sherwin Williams is near the top of my watch list. Just because I've regretted not owning this company one too many times, uh, you give me a chance to buy these shares at 25 times forward, I'm going to do it. The yield's not high. Uh, you know, if we drop another eight or 10 bucks, it will be above 1%. Um, looking at their performance here, you do see, you will see very strong and pretty reliable double digit dividend growth. Yes, there's been some poor years that happens, like I said, uh, during the cyclical downturns. Uh, the company has struggled. But uh, the, the overall, the dividend growth results are fantastic. I'll go ahead and pull it up here on the uh, dividend champions list over at Wide Moat Research. We see that Sherwin-Williams has a 44-year dividend growth streak, a five-year dividend growth rate of 14.5%, <coughs> excuse me, and a 10-year dividend growth rate of 16.3%. So fabulous dividend growth. Yes, a low yield. Uh, but, you know, I'm willing to be patient, even a 1% yield compounding at, you know, 15% a year. Uh, that means it doubles. We'll go ahead and do the rule of 72, excuse me, 72 divided by 15. So every 4.8, we'll go ahead and say every five years, the yield is doubling. That means every 10 years, roughly, uh, it is quadrupling. So that means in 10 years, I'm talking about a 4% yield on cost. Uh, you know, I, I can wait 10 years, right? I have time, uh, God willing, and the company is expected to continue. It's very strong growth. So, uh, you know, this is maybe just a personal thing. You know, I certainly don't think that this is a cheap stock at the moment. I'm sure there's quite a lot of people that will argue the stock is still expensive and that it needs to trade, you know, down to 200 bucks a share or something. But for me, uh, I, this company has been on my watch list for years and years and years. And, you know, I want to take advantage of this, you know, 30% sell off. So, Hopefully I have the opportunity. Like I said, I'm, I'm kind of targeting that 25 times forward mark, uh, you know, basically 230, $235 a share. We'll see if we get there. Uh, if we do, if this company has another bad day or two, uh, don't be surprised to see me, uh, you know, for the first time ever. Uh, and thankfully I, I would, I will be so grateful adding shares of S W uh, S H W to my dividend growth portfolio. Uh, kind of sticking in the consumer area, getting out of the industrial and into the sort of uh, consumer discretionary space, we have Domino's Pizza here. Uh, this is a company that I've owned for a while now. I bought it, uh, I think, during this dip, right? I think I bought it right here. I timed it pretty well, actually. I think I bought some shares at like 360 and then once again at 330. The stock rallied all the way up to 560. I felt like an absolute genius uh, a lot of my subscribers at Dividend Kings were patting me on the back. They bought alongside me, made a lot of money. And then you can see, like so many blue chip companies this year, the shares have cratered. Uh, Domino's Pizza is down a lot, but we will see exactly down 31.5% this year. This is a high growth stock, as you can see. Uh, wonderful, wonderful growth. Yeah, they struggled back in 28, uh, you know, 27, 28, but they kind of reinvented their company. They changed their pizza sauce, they changed their crust, and more importantly, they're investing heavily in technology. This company, uh, they're kind of, they have the leading mobile app, they, they worked on delivery, they're working on drones, they're working on autonomous vehicles, uh, autonomous pizza cookers, you know, anything technology related, 
uh, you know, Domino's is interested in. They've been very forward thinking as a management team. Uh, Jim Cramer has famously said that this isn't a pizza company that, that works with technology. This is a technology company that sells pizza. Um, that sounds a little silly, but when you look at the growth, it's really not. Furthermore, this during the last decade from 2010 to 2020, uh, if memory serves and don't quote me here, but I'm sure you can Google this. Uh, this was the best performing like stock in the entire S&P 500. Um, and that's simply amazing. I think Netflix was second and Domino's was first. And uh, for a pizza company, that's fabulous. Uh, I do eat their pizza from time to time. Obviously, it's not the highest quality product, but for $7.99 for a large three topping, it doesn't get much better than that in terms of value. Uh, even though the stock has sold off, like I said, with regard to several companies in this video so far, the earnings are continuing to trend higher. Yes, uh, the growth is slowing this year, down from the double digits like we're used to seeing to just 5%, but 5% is still positive. And then furthermore, in 2023 and 2024, analysts are expecting to see DPC accelerate back up to that 15-ish you know, percent uh, EPS growth. So uh, I went ahead. They're currently trading for 27.5 times roughly. That is where this pink line on the chart represents. You can see this is below where it has been basically for most of the last like five to seven years. Uh, yes, during the it's actually right kind of where it bottomed during the uh, COVID sell off. It has had some worse troughs uh, recently down where I bought it here uh, during late uh, mid 2019. It was all the way down at below 25 times earnings. So, yes, it you know, the stock could go lower. This pink line isn't the sort of same support level, you know, that we're seeing here with an alphabet where it hasn't really crossed below it. This gives me more confidence than, uh, you know, this does, for instance, the history has already shown that this support level has been and can be broken. However, uh, you know, when we're talking about such strong growth, um, you know, you give me a chance to buy a company like this, uh, near fair value, you see the long-term fair values down here at 23.8 times. If we go to the 10-year, it's actually higher, right? During the last 10 years, kind of since the resurgence, <coughs> excuse me, and sort of just refocus of this company, the average is actually 30.4 times. So we're below the historical average. We're in line with this kind of, uh, you know, my sort of 27.5 times target. Um, so, you know, I think this is an interesting place to buy some dominoes. Dividend yields not high. Uh, the dividend growth has been pretty fabulous, um, and I don't think that's going to change. We see dividend growth seek of ten years throughout this ten-year period. Uh, you know, basically twenty percent a year. Um, you know, average. Let's see if the fast graph will give us a ten-year average here. They haven't quite gotten it uh, during the last nine years, according to this, and this counts in a zero zero percent year, ten point eight times. So. Strong, strong uh, double digit, oops, sorry, a dividend growth with Domino's. I expect that to continue. This company buys back a ton of shares. They even issue a lot of debt to buy back shares. You see, they don't have a, a credit rating. A lot of people worry a lot about their, their debt ratios, and that is a risk with this stock. But the management team has always bought back a bunch of shares, and then that has worked out very well for them because... Uh, they increase their EPS by doing so with financial engineering and then uh, with the organic growth combined with the financial engineering growth has pushed the share price much higher, meaning that all the shares they bought during these years have turned into fantastic values and pretty good return on invested capital. So uh, Domino's, once again, a, a stock more speculative, lower yield. Uh, it has some issues with regard to the balance sheet, but a pretty interesting play in the consumer space, something I would consider adding to. I've owned shares for a while, like I said, since this dip, but I didn't buy in super heavily, so I can certainly uh, add some more DPZ to my portfolio and not you know, have to worry about single stock risk, so something I might consider doing. Uh, Starbucks, on the other hand, I've been overweight for years and years and years. When it comes to dividend growth companies in the kind of retail space, it doesn't really get much better than Starbucks, uh, historically speaking anyway. Once again, you will see very consistent double-digit EPS growth here. The company really struggled during COVID, right? Uh, you know, the pandemic kind of forced everybody to social distance. It shut down restaurants. Starbucks is not a pizza delivery place. They don't have drive throughs really. Some of them do, I think. But, uh, you know, anyway, this is all about in-person retail. So 
uh, you know, they struggled, but they bounced back. They're already well above their 2019 EPS levels. Once again, growth is expected to slow during fiscal 2022, not negative, just slow, and then reaccelerate. So this is a very similar story that we're seeing throughout this entire uh, video with growth this year kind of struggling a bit, analysts expecting it to bounce back. It, it looks like because of the short-term struggles, a lot of investors are fearfully selling their shares. But as someone with a kind of longer-term perspective, I'm more focused on these future years. I'm happy to buy into this weakness and take advantage. So let's go ahead and type in Starbucks here just to check the year to date movement. And we see shares are down 33.2% on a year to date basis. So sell offs like this are pretty rare with this company. We saw one during 2020. I don't expect to see another 100 year pandemic coming through anytime soon. So uh, other than that, this is basically one of the steepest sell offs we've had in Starbucks shares during the last you know 10 or 20 years. So um, two and a half percent dividend yield, I think double digit dividend growth is likely. We'll go ahead and pull it up here on the um, dividend champions list and check out the stats. 12 year dividend growth streak, 16.7 uh, five year dividend growth rate and 20.7 10 year dividend growth rate. This is de accelerating. I, you know, I think kind of moving forward eight to 12% makes sense, even maybe eight to 10 because of the uh, slowing growth and the, <coughs> excuse me, the fact that uh, so much of Starbucks growth kind of comes from Asia and, and most specifically China. And there is obviously risk associated with that. Um, at, if US China Chinese relations ever sort of deteriorate further than they already have in recent years, uh, you know, companies like Starbucks can and will suffer. Uh, so that's something that investors need to consider. But analysts obviously aren't concerned and assuming that these consensus growth estimates, uh, you know, come to fruition in the coming years. I think buying Starbucks here at, you know, 78 bucks a share is going to end up looking like a pretty, uh, you know, genius move in the not too distant future. So and in the meantime, you get to collect a two and a half percent yield. Uh, never that bad of, a, of an option, in my opinion. Uh, it's well above the S&P 500 yield. Yeah, you can get higher yields on bonds now that the you know the interest rates have risen, but bonds have stagnant uh, stagnant passive income growth, and Starbucks should be compounding its dividend at a roughly 10 percent you know 10 to 15 percent clip in the near term. So SBUX, uh, a company I haven't really considered buying in quite some time. I've owned it for years. It's been overweight. I had no desire to kind of you know, chase the momentum and buy at these, you know, 30 to 35 times premiums, uh, you know, but you give me a chance to buy here 23.7 times uh, blended and looking forward to 2023. And this is kind of what's really attractive to me. We look forward, you know, uh, what is that? Roughly 18 months, uh, 385. We're looking at basically 20 times earnings. So 20 times earnings attached to Starbucks dream come true, uh, you know, for the last couple decades. I think it's a dream come true in the present. I think five to 10 years from now, anybody not buying at that level will regret it. I certainly don't want to experience that regret, that regret myself. So uh, don't be surprised if you see me adding to Starbucks. Um, I talked about uh, Exylum recently. This is a kind of water treatment and processing company in the industrial space. Water stocks have always kind of traded with this super high premium and that's only gone up. Uh, but we have seen a massive sell-off with this name uh, throughout 2022 thus far. We'll go ahead and see how we're doing here. It's not going to be pretty. Uh, down 27.5% on a year-to-date basis. The company, once again, same story, slowing growth this year, massive acceleration in 2023-2024. Um, we'll go ahead and look at the forecasting tool. Even without multiple contraction from this kind of down 30%, uh, level with regard to this kind of 33.75 valuation, we see uh, very small growth by the end of this year. However, uh, you know the opportunity to compound capital is 17%, or you know essentially 17% moving forward, assuming consensus growth estimates get hit and the stock con continues to trade in this kind of 33 times area. You will see that this is essentially in line with the five-year average, 31.77. We'll go ahead and round that up to 32. 32 times is the average five-year premium here. And that represents an $81 share price. That's kind of been my price target. The stock's been hovering between like 88 
in 84 for a while now. So I haven't bought. I mentioned this in a, this fit, this stock, I think three or four weeks ago, it was at the top of my watch list. So we just haven't seen it go down to this uh, blue line yet. Uh, this has kind of been my arbitrary place. This five-year average, roughly 81 times, just a round number. I like that. Uh, that will equate to an approximately 1.5% dividend yield. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I think that's an interesting place to start uh, buying these shares. Management recently said that they think they can compound over the next decade their EPS at like a 10 to 15% clip. So if that happens and analysts are projecting that to happen in the near term, uh, you know, just go ahead and try to imagine this chart looking, you know, 10 years from now, way up here in the right corner of the screen. You can see the fundamentals should support, uh, you know, pretty significantly higher share prices in the future. You get a one and a half percent dividend yield in the meantime. Um, the dividend growth statistics here, I think, are fairly attractive. I'll go ahead and pull that up on ooh, not XTL, XYL. Uh, 12 year dividend growth streak and double digit uh, five year dividend growth rate and the 12.6 percent. And then over the last 10 years, this company has compounded its dividend at 27.2 percent. I obviously don't expect that to happen over the next 10 years, but I think this sort of average dividend growth is likely or or at least possible over the next 10 years. So, you know, like I've said before, you give me a one and a half percent dividend yield compounding at 12 to 15 percent. That is a great recipe for success. So this is more speculative, more risky at this level. Uh, balance sheet is not is one of the more you know lower on this list at BBB. It is investment grade, but it's not a rated I generally you know, like to invest in A-rated companies. That's not the case here, but this is an interesting kind of mid-cap name uh, with strong growth prospects starting in 2023 that I uh, wouldn't mind to kind of take advantage of this massive sell-off for and then ride the wave higher. Uh, we're going to leave Fast Graphs here for a moment and talk about uh, Blackstone. This is a, an alternative asset manager. Very similar, well, not similar, uh, very similar. I guess that's an overstatement, but similar to Brookfield Asset Management, another sort of alternative asset manager that I own. Um, Blackstone is a larger company. They're, they're more global with their operations, and, uh, and that they've struggled in recent weeks as well. Rising rates, a lot of people th uh, assume that rising rates are really going to hurt these asset management plays. That has been the case historically. <coughs> Excuse me. However, uh, the company just reported its Q1 results, and as you can see on the screen here, they were fantastic. We see, uh, and, the, and the reason I'm not showing this on FastGraph is because uh, this company doesn't really trade on the typical like EPS or free cash flow. They trade on uh, distributable earnings, DE, or fee-related earnings, and then assets under management. So we can see fee-related earnings were up 55% on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, distributable earnings were up 63%. We see their total assets under management was up 41%. Their fee bearing uh, AUM was up 41%. Uh, you know, all of these uh, basically metrics were wonderful. The company, um, it looks like a dividend cut. They pay a variable dividend, so it's not like a normal stair step pattern like we see with many of the wonderful companies that I track. They pay a dividend each quarter that's kind of dependent on how much money they make. So uh, the dividend uh, that they just declared is actually less than the, the dividend they paid last quarter. So some people are like, oh, that's a dividend cut. However, if you look at a long-term chart of uh, BX's dividend, it is it does trend higher. That's especially been the case in recent years. And I think that will be the case moving forward as well. You can see the company has been very generous with their shareholder returns, both through dividends and and buybacks. I pulled up, this is the their Q1 earnings report. I pulled up another couple pages. Once again, this just kind of shows the very strong growth that they're experiencing uh, during Q1 with their free related earnings. Uh, you know, that's essentially just, uh, it's not the same, but I kind of think of that as like those reoccurring revenue streams that the tech companies love. Uh, you know, I, I love uh, fee bearing capital. It's pretty predictable and reliable, especially as long as there's still trust uh, in the management team, and uh, there's been, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, uh, pretty massive inflows to Blackstone. A lot of people are still looking for higher returns uh, than you can typically find in either the equity space or in the bond space. Uh, in today's economic environment, these sort of alternative asset management 
managers, excuse me, have been a great place to be, especially people that focus on hard assets like Blackstone. These uh, Blackstone owns so much real estate, uh, largely residential, and uh, you know, so it's an interesting play on that as well. Um, once again, more charts from their report. You see AUM, fee bearing AUM, and then perpetual capital AUM, all growing very strongly over the past year. Um, you have to just love seeing this this sort of growth. I thought the quarter was fantastic. What is and then uh, excuse, oops, that was a mistake. Uh, but it, it appears the market didn't agree. Uh, if you go look at the BX chart recently, you will see a sell off. The stock was down roughly 2% last week. We did see a little pop in earnings, but then it sold off since. I'm not sure why it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but the stock's down roughly, you know, 12 and a half, 13% year to date. It is underperforming the broader market. Um, the dividend yield, this is wrong. Uh, I think the forward dividend is roughly 3.7% right now, though it's hard to predict, like I said, because it is a variable dividend, but needless to say, three and a half to four and a half percent dividend yield is very attractive in today's market. And that is what Blackstone off uh, Blackstone offers. Uh, so you know, I, I'm it's not a dividend growth stock per se because it is unreliable and unpredictable. But it, uh, the dividend here is trending higher. The yield is quite attractive. And I I just I want to keep adding in exposure to hard assets and these sort of alternative asset managers to my portfolio. I feel comfortable doing so. And uh, so Blackstone is near the top of my watch list after it's uh, the, the recent strong quarter and then the ensuing sell-off. Now uh, we will go to Black Rock. Interesting names. Uh, I put them back to back. They're both kind of financial plays. This is not an alternative asset manager. They are a sort of just financial asset manager. Uh, they're best known for all of their, <coughs> excuse me, their ETF products. Uh, you'll see memes and, and headlines like Black Brock owns everything, and they do own quite a bit of equities. They own large positions of many different companies, both public and private, due to uh, the way that they manage their business. You know, if all the ETFs that they manage, uh, they have to own the equities, obviously, to have the ETF. So when you're buying shares of that ETF, you are owning the shares of the companies within. Uh, fantastic growth. Once again, same story, tough year 2022 here, but expected reacceleration. Um, very strong growth historically. Let's go let's pull this up to the max. You will see a couple down years. This is economically sensitive. It is interest rate sensitive. You will see that the stock sold off in 2018 when interest rates are rising. We're seeing the same thing play out here. However, we did see a very strong rally uh, from that bottom. I don't know when the Fed's going to pivot from hawkish to dovish. But ultimately, I don't think it really matters, right? This was when rates were rising. And we do see EPS was rising just fine. The sentiment wasn't. The sentiment was negative. However, the market was ignoring fundamentals at the time. And they're sort of doing the same thing here. So uh, roughly 17 times earnings at the pink line. You will see uh, historically over the last five years or so, this has been uh, you know a nice place to buy the stock. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, looking at the last 10 years, we see 18 and a half times is the average PD multiple applied to BlackRock over the last five years. It's 20.4 times. So uh, whether we're looking at it through a 10 or a five year time span, the current 17 times, you know, roughly multiple is below average. Earnings is fine. The dividend's quite strong here after selling off. Let's see what we have here for uh, BLK. It's not good on a year to date basis. The stock has certainly underperformed the market, uh, down you know 27.3%. So uh, here we are, down to 27% here, pretty significant sell-off, and uh, that that's pushed the yield up to 2.9%. So a, a nearly 3% yield on this company is very attractive. They are a double-digit dividend grower. Um, let's see here what we have here. Sorry, my voice is kind of letting out. I feel like I'm running out of steam, but I'll, I'll, I'll get through this, and uh, I'll go drink some more tea here. So... Uh, 12.5 five-year dividend growth rate, 11.6 10-year dividend growth rate, 13-year dividend growth streak, fantastic dividend uh, growth-oriented metrics. You know, wonderful company, double uh, A rated balance sheet, 100 billion dollar market cap. Uh, it's hard to find <coughs> operational kind of critiques here. A lot of people, you know, 
don't like the sort of ESG stances that management's taken or, or some of the investments they've made or haven't made, etc. Uh, their CEO, Larry Fink, is a somewhat controversial figure. However, like I've said many times, I do my best to sort of ignore all that and instead focus on the fundamentals. I see a lot more black here than I see red. I see a ton of double-digit growth. I wouldn't be surprised to see that continue to happen. Moving forward, the yield's quite high. The, the dividend growth is very strong. Uh, there's a lot to like about BlackRock here. And like I said, down nearly 30%, uh, this stock is rising on my watch list. I own a large position, but I could add some more. Uh, I certainly wouldn't mind to go overweight in a company like BlackRock, especially with a nearly 3% yield. And the last stock that I will talk about, and uh, that's a good thing, I'm, I feel like I'm starting to lose my voice here, is Store Capital. This is a REIT. This is the only REIT on this list. I've, I love real estate. Um, I'll actually I'll pull this up. Um, I was actually writing an article not too long ago, and uh, I found this interesting. Go to the S and P five hundred sector performance. If my fingers will cooperate, I always just use the facility the fidelity page here. Um, go to performance, and last week the market got crushed. Overall, we see. It was down, you know, 2.75%. But look, REITs did fantastically well of 1.24%. So massive outperformance. Uh, this is a REIT. I've been working hard to sort of increase uh, REITs up to like 10% of my personal portfolio. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I've tried to hold in a big one and there it is. And uh, it's been well. It's done really well. Uh, Realty Income, uh, Agree Realty. WP Carry. A lot of the REITs that I've talked about on this channel have uh, seen their prices go up recently and their valuations go up as sort of investors uh, move into real estate during this sort of risk off moment. Uh, but store capital has sold off recently. Unlike a realty income or unlike an agree realty that kind of focuses on investment grade tenants, this company focuses on the middle market. It kind of uh, focuses on lower quality tenants, but management here believes that they can kind of negotiate each deal up to sort of investment grade standards or very reliable standards on an individual company by company basis. Historically, they've done quite well. You see here very reliable growth. Uh, this is AFFO, not EPS. This is the metric I look at when we're talking about REITs. Uh, but anyway, Store Capital has offered some of the highest bottom line growth in the net lease REIT space or since they've IPO'd, some of the highest dividend growth. And yet, uh, because of the sort of structure that they pursued, and as well as some, some kind of turmoil at the top with their founder and former CEO Chris Volk leaving the company, uh, recently sort of being forced out by other manager and the board of directors, That's that's been... You know, kind of a stressing thing for investors, and that has, I think, factored into this sort of sell-off we've seen over the past year. But what has happened now is that store is trading at a huge, uh, you know, discount relative to many of its peers, just 14 times AFFO here. The yield is 5.2%, roughly. You know, uh, ag agree, Realty yields less than 4% now. I think Realty income is right around 4%. Those companies are trading for like 18 to 20 times AFFO. Uh, store capital generally trades at a discount because of its middle market focus. However, its fundamental growth has been uh, the same, if not better. Uh, it does just carry higher risk, I think. But looking forward, we see you know mid single digit growth expectations over the next three years. Uh, you know, I think that organic growth combined with a uh, multiple expansion. We it wasn't long ago that these shares were trading for 18 to 20 times. Uh, you know, you see 18 times here, 17 times. I think, you know, let's go ahead and look at the forecasting tool. If store were to trade at, you know, roughly, you know, 17 times, 18 times earnings, uh, you know, we're looking at massive, massive opportunities. We have a 5% yield. We have, uh, you know, mid single digit bottom line growth. And then via multiple expansion, we're talking about, you know, roughly 40%, uh, 45% to 50%, uh, you know, compounded uh, total returns by the end of this year on an annualized basis. And then 22% and you know 16%. So basically, between 15 to 20% kind of medium term gains, I think, are, are possible here because of the weakness that the shares have experienced recently. Uh, store is not a name that I would want to probably be overweight. I will always own more realty income. I will always own more WP carry than I will store. However, store's quality is high enough. It is investment. It is investment grade. 
we do see here if we t look at the uh, dividend champions list, pretty solid, you know, mid single digit um, dividend growth rate, seven year dividend increase streak. They haven't cut their dividend since they have established it from their IPO. So there's certainly a lot to be said here. It's got a relatively young company. Um, you know, it's more volatile than many of its peers, but I find store to be interesting here. Uh, you know, kind of down on a year to date basis while so many of its peers are up. Uh, let's, you know, let's just <clears throat> put this chart into your mind and then we'll pull up a realty income chart really here really quickly here. This is kind of the creme de la creme of the space. You can see ever since the COVID sell off, they've been trending higher. That hasn't been the case for store. So I think that is a, a pretty interesting kind of relative value opportunity. Uh, I love the 5% yield attached to store 5.2%. Uh, most of the stocks that I've discussed on this list have been lower yielding names, more focused on growth, more focused on dividend growth. Oftentimes when I you know, put capital to work, I like to kind of buy a basket. I'll maybe buy one growth stock, one core stock, one high dividend growth stock, and then one high yielder, something like that, kind of just stay diversified. So with that in mind, store could easily end up being the kind of high yield component of my April uh, you know, savings basket in the market. So uh, how many companies was that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, uh, 11, 11 ideas for you guys. You know, hopefully you enjoy this video. Uh, like I said, I need to go drink some tea, take a cough drop, uh, you know, get in the shower for some uh, humidity for my throat. Hopefully, uh, the coughing wasn't too annoying. I am so sorry for that. I am certainly looking forward to getting that fixed, but, uh, it is what it is. I, you know, I, I, I assume a coughing video is better than no video. Uh, so like I said, leave a comment in the section below. Let me you know, know what stocks are at the top of your watch list. Always looking for more ideas for research. Let me know what you think about my watch list. And uh, until next time, I wish you guys all the best. And uh, you know, stay safe out there. Be well. Uh, all the best wishes to you and yours uh, in life and in the markets. Thank you so much. Bye.